after I heard my first fairy tale, I had always dreamed of growing up and being whisked away by a handsome prince and a white horse and living happily ever after, glass slippers, castle, and doll. I was living on South Beach in 1994, and it was a few days after my 26th birthday when my dream became reality. Except he wasn't quite a prince on a white horse. He was a New York City cop named Sergio on vacation with mutual friends of ours from the neighborhood we grew up in, Flushing, Queens. See, there are still queens in my fairy tale, just not the royal kind. And Sergio didn't quite whisk me away. Um, instead, I drove a 17-foot-long U-Haul truck back to Queens a year later to convince him I was the woman of his dreams. And thankfully, it didn't take long for me to do that. And by the summer of 1995, we were living together. Sergio loved to call himself Big Daddy, and it suited his big personality. He was all heart. Uh, he was a guy's guy, a mama's boy, a protective big, big brother, and in the blink of an eye, he could switch from talking with the thickest Queen's accent to the most melodic Argentine Spanish. Sergio was my soulmate, my best friend, my everything, and he was by my side during some of the most significant times of my life. He gave me the courage to search for and meet my biological mother's family and was there when I learned the truth about her suicide, which she committed when I was six months old. He was there when my dad died after losing his five-year battle against brain strokes. And when I fulfilled my dream of owning a gift shop, which we named Inner Peace, Sergio was there to hang the banner on our opening night. Our business took off right away and Though Sergio loved his job as a narcotics detective, he left the NYPD for New York's fire department in 2000 so he could spend more time with me in the store. Later that year, we bought our first home, a beautiful garden apartment just blocks away from Inner Peace, and with a solid foundation in place, Sergio was finally ready to get married and start a family. On June 30th, 2001, the seven-year anniversary of our first kiss, Sergio proposed and made me the happiest princess from Flushing, Queens, who ever lived. We were on top of the world that summer, planning for our wedding and for the boy and girl set of twins we hoped to conceive on our honeymoon. On the morning of September 9th, 2001, Sergio scored the winning goal for the fire department soccer team. Later that day, we were surrounded by our friends and closest family at a birthday party, and it was a perfect day filled with triumph, joy, love, and laughter. And we, when we got home that night, I had one last picture left in my camera and took this of him. The following morning, he left me for his 24-hour shift at his firehouse, ladder 132 in Brooklyn. And I was waiting for him to come home on the morning of September 11th and watching New York One News when the anchorman announced the first plane crash into the towers. Like most people, I imagine it was a small plane which inflicted minimal damage, but when I saw live the second plane deliberately crash, I knew in that instant our world was changed forever. With the collapse of the first tower, the thought, Sergio's in there, flashed in my mind, but I just dismissed it just as quickly. And after the collapse of the second tower and the attack on the Pentagon and the crash of Flight 93, I just couldn't stop crying for all of those who had died in such a horrific way. And it felt like a bad dream, one that I was watching on a small television from the safety of our home, one that I thought I had no personal connection to. As the hours passed and with no news from Sergio, I convinced myself that he was at the site helping in the search and rescue efforts. There was no way his truck could have gotten to Manhattan from Brooklyn in time, and he was there to fulfill his calling to help others. But later that night, Mayor Giuliani issued a hotline for fire department families to call, which led to the confirmation that Sergio, along with the five other men on the truck with him, were missing. And so my nightmare began. But because there was so much confusion around the numbers missing and the numbers confirmed dead, I needed to believe that he was alive. 
I needed to imagine that the towers were made of this super light aluminum, which fell perfectly over a void filled with all of those waiting to be rescued. And I needed to believe that for 28 days because others had survived being trapped after other disasters for that long. But by day 26, I was at my wit's end with no physical proof that he was gone and no sign that he was alive. And so I reached out to a psychic medium in my desperation who leveled the truth that Sergio would never come home. And in my heart, I knew she was right. It was excruciating to live. And there were many days that I didn't want to. But I did so anyway. In order to survive and accept that Sergio and the children that I longed to have with him were gone so suddenly, I needed to dream differently. At first, I just dreamt of getting through the day, waking up to the nightmare of an empty home and an empty life, and completing the most menial of tasks, brushing my teeth, taking a shower, eating, drinking. All were proof that I still had breath in me, even though I felt dead inside. As time passed, I started to dream of finding help because I was drowning in a tidal wave of sorrow and disbelief and trauma. And I found a lifeboat in the therapy and support group meetings I attended three times a week. I dreamt of taking Sergio's last name, Villanueva, because he insisted on it once we were married. And I went to the Queens County clerk to do so. And with no recovery of his remains, I dreamt of giving a beautiful memorial service to honor him, which included my saying our wedding vows and his eulogy and a tribute book filled with pictures and quotes that captured who he was. On June 7, 2002, almost nine months later, and 10 days after they cleared the last bits of debris from Ground Zero, I and hundreds of family members, friends, firefighters, police officers, complete strangers gathered to give Sergio a well-deserved hero send-off. Looking back, I realized I did a lot of dreaming back then when it seemed barely possible to live. My dreams, some big and some small, were what propelled me forward when the pain of grief was insisting I keep stuck. In the days leading up to our milestone days, our birthdays, our anniversary, I would dream of seizing the day in the way Sergio would have done. On my birthday, I signed up for motorcycle lessons. On our anniversary, I jumped out of a plane <laughs> while her holding Sergio's prayer card. And a part of me secretly wished that that parachute wouldn't open, but another part of me just wanted to feel alive again. And I have to say, not only did I feel alive after jumping 13,000 feet from a plane, I had a killer migraine from hyperventilating due to the excitement of it all. <laughs> My dreams gave me purpose, and in that purpose was an unrelenting yearning to bring meaning to Sergio's life, to my experience of losing him, and to the senselessness of the attacks of September 11th. And so my dream of sharing our story and giving others a personal connection to the day became the driving force in bringing meaning on my long journey toward healing. In the summer of 2002, Nine of us who were affected by the attacks in different ways signed on to participate in the documentary Rebirth. Producer and director Jim Whitaker's intention for the film was to record through time-lapse photography the rebuilding of the site at Ground Zero while also capturing the emotional time-lapse of our lives. Our commitment to the film was for 10 years and included annual three to five hour long sit-down interviews where we would discuss what our day-to-day -day life was like and how we were or weren't moving forward. Aside from the interviews, the production team would also film many significant events in our lives. They were there every anniversary when I hung a, a poster for Sergio at Ground Zero. They were there in 2003 when I sought sanctuary back here in Miami and transformed into a biker chick. <laughs> As a matter of fact, about two weeks before we filmed this scene, I had driven into a gas station and met Ray, the man who had become my husband. 
Now, I'm not going to lie, it was very difficult for me to fully open up my heart again. I thought that the whole idea of letting go in grief meant that I had to somehow relinquish my love for Sergio in order to create space for loving Ray. But over time, I came to understand that all I really had to let go of were my expectations for the future I thought I'd have with Sergio. And I learned that our hearts can expand in direct proportion to the amount of love we give and the amount of love we take in. And so I began to surrender and I started to envision a new future with Ray. Not only did I realize he was another soulmate of mine, he was also the other love of my life. In 2006, we rented a white chopper, our white iron horse, and drove to a secluded beach in Hawaii where we were married. Our only guests were the Rebirth film crew and Jim Whitaker signed as our witness. <laughs> it was one of the happiest days of my life and as you can see from this picture, I was pretty much on top of the world again. Later that year, I read Sergio's name at Ground Zero during the five-year anniversary uh, memorial service. And it also happened to be the official start date of my pregnancy with our first daughter, Amelia. Besides filming her birth in 2007, the crew filmed a rainbow over South Miami Hospital on the day she was born. The following year, they were with us as we welcomed Samantha, who was due on September 11th, but arrived a week early by C-section. At long last, I was living my happily even after. And my dream came true with a beautiful yet completely different life than I had expected. In 2009, all of us sat down for our final interviews because Jim Whitaker felt the film had announced its own ending with the settling of our lives. It was two years ahead of schedule. He and his team spent the next year and a half editing the hundreds of hours of footage into the almost two hour long feature film and the nine short films dedicated to each of our journeys. While the film was in post-production in 2010, my happily even after took an unexpected turn as life always manages to, manages to do. Um, Emilia, who was two and a half by then, was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, a high functioning form of autism. A few months later, Samantha started showing similar quirks in her development, and she received the diagnosis as well. Now, a running thought I had during this time was, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> really? <laughs> I already had my share. Wasn't life supposed to be easy now? But I had already learned the hard lesson that life is life. And as much as we expect it to be, it just ain't always easy. I reminded myself that I'd also learned many tools for resilience on my grief journey, and if we tapped into them, time and change would carry us through. Ray and I reached out for support from other, from other parents and found a community to walk the autism road with. We learned about the importance of an early intervention of therapies and found a team of dedicated professionals, including a musical therapist, uh, who are helping the girls reach their fullest potential. We received hope by learning about the many adults with autism who are leading happy and productive lives while contributing to our world with their extraordinary gifts. And we began to dream again of seeing our daughter's future filled with boundless possibility. And by the time rebirth was finished, we had found a new normal in our happy yet not so normal lives. As our lives and filming evolved, so did the mission of the nonprofit organization Project Rebirth. Recognizing the value of having the longest film record of people coping with trauma after 9-11 and the visual history of the rebuilding of the site at Ground Zero, it was a natural fit for the National September 11th Museum. Besides our films, Jim Whitaker also created a permanent 10 minute long installation called Rebirth at Ground Zero where visitors can literally sense the rebuilding of the site as they are surrounded by floor-to-ceiling screens projecting the time-lapse film narrated by our voices. Aside from the historical record, 
many educators and members of the mental health community also saw the value of witnessing the long trajectory of our journey as a powerful teaching tool. With this in mind, Project Rebirth began creating programs using our films to facilitate healing, foster hope, and build resilience. After hearing from several widows that seeing my story helped them, I joined the Project Rebirth team in 2011. I created a workshop using my film and presented it at Camp Widow, a weekend-long program which brings widow people from across the world together for peer support, practical tools, and relevant resources as to, to help them as they rebuild their lives after losing their life partners. I talked about grief over time and validated that there is no fixed timeline for grief. We grieve because we love and we learn to carry the pain of our loss in our own time and on our own terms because each of our journeys is unique. I saw firsthand over and over the incredible healing power of sharing those sacred journeys with others who are coping with similar loss. There's nothing more comforting than being able to stand wherever you are in your grief without judgment. Nothing more encouraging than hearing someone else say, I feel the same way. Camp Widow was such a fulfilling experience. I returned again and again and became a member of the advisory board. And next month in Tampa, I will participate in my seventh camp um, and participate in the 5K Widow Dash Dress as the Fairy Widow, spreading widow hope, love, and joy to those on the road after me. We are also using our films to teach middle, high school, and college level students about September 11th. Besides giving them the personal connection to the victims and survivors, we are teaching them that while the attacks were an act of evil, love and compassion ruled the day in aftermath. We are teaching them that love never dies and patience, therapy, peer support, and other ways to build their own resilience when, when life gets hard for them. Um, they are learning what it truly means to be a hero and to never forget that all of those who lost their lives because of September 11th, including those due to 9-11 related illnesses and in the wars against terrorism that followed, were so much more than just names on a memorial. They are learning what it truly means to be a hero and the biggest lesson that life is fragile so take nothing and no one for granted. And lastly, we are using our films in the first responder and military communities to teach strategies for recognizing and coping with post-traumatic stress and in programs focusing on post-traumatic growth. Being able to give back to the countless heroes who lifted us up in our own time of need has been a full circle of healing and in more ways than I can ever express, by helping others in their own journeys of, of recovery, I am bringing meaning to the nightmare I lived almost 15 years ago. Our ability to dream is what makes the difference in living a life filled with love and joy, purpose and meaning. And dreaming is an amazing tool for resilience. Like love, our capacity to dream has no limits and we can always dream to give us hope and courage to push through our despair toward a better future. Dreams are the seeds of our hearts which grow into the fruits of our lives when we water them with action. So, if you are struggling to cope with loss or adversity, I encourage you to dream your way through it. Dream of whatever gives you comfort or hope or of that which makes you curious or brave Dream of the ways in which you can grow from your experience and transform your suffering into something for the greater good. And when you're ready, take whatever steps you can to follow those dreams toward your happiness and the meaning you are searching for. You'll be amazed at what life still has in store for you. Thank you. Thank you.